The following conversation with Tony Arzler took place on Manhattan's West Side on August 24th, 2022. Tony Arzler is a multimedia artist whose work explores technology's impact on humanity. His installations, combining sculpture, projections, and archival objects, offer spectral visions and disorienting narratives, often resurrecting ancient phantasmagorias for our own questioning times. You have illustrious ancestors, or at least ancestors, who have sort of prepared you for what you're doing, um, for better or worse. Can you talk about them a little bit? I guess I'll work my way back a little bit. You know, my dad was an editor and writer for Reader's Digest and also Angels on Earth, which is a magazine he started towards the end of his life. It's a Catholic family, so mm -hmm. there's a kind of a little bit of mysticism, more than a little bit of mysticism in there. And my mom was a nurse, but also kind of a closet artist who never really, mm. you know, very talented at drawing and uh -huh. so forth, but never really did it. And then my father's um, father, Fulton Aursler Sr., was the famous guy who used to live in New York, started out in uh, Baltimore and was a magician, writer, wrote many, many books was friends with Harry Houdini and so forth and Arthur Conan Doyle, but uh -huh. also wrote The Greatest Story Ever Told, which was a popularization of the Bible, uh -huh. if you can imagine. So, and it was an epic movie in the 60s, right? Yeah, he was dead by then. And unfortunately, I, I, I never met him. You know, he was gone by the time I was uh, born. And his wife, Grace Perkins, wrote, I think, maybe 30, 40 books, something like that, a mm -hmm. lot of kind of racy pulpy uh, love stories and things, mm -hmm. many of which that were made into movies as well. Mm -hmm. Night Nurse is one of her uh, known <laughs> trailblazers. Kind of. But Fulton though was um, also, he was a magician, but he was also kind of, uh, had a mission to debunk fraudsters or whatever you want to call so -called them. So-called psychics. Yeah. Psy So-called psychics, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and right here in New York, you know. So he would, mm -hmm. I guess Houdini, who was much his senior, uh, was doing that, and as as mysticism, as a kind of spiritualism, the a later wave of spiritualism came up, came around between the wars. A lot of the magicians sort of took that energy into their shows, you know. So there was this kind of Imitating. after all the losses of World War One, there was a a kind of bubbling up of of a new kind of uh, religiosity, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word in the form of mysticism, which also enabled, you know, a lot of women to kind of take the position of power. As mediums. As mediums, exactly. And my grandfather, even though he was quite a mystic, and uh, Houdini, who was the son of a uh, rabbi, you know, had this strain of mysticism, but mm -hmm. they were really against the fraudulent psychics and so forth. So there was this kind of battle. So in some ways they were defending true religion in a way, right? I mean, they were seeing it as a kind of a false um, religion or distraction from traditional religion? Possibly. I guess, I, yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't, you know, I wrote Imponderable, the movie, on the subject, mm -hmm. but I don't have any exact quotes about, you know, I mean, they were just really against fraudsters because right. it's hard to imagine today, like it's saying. You do see articles, in fact, right about this neighborhood about psychics who managed to get some guy and bilk them out of like <laughs> a few million bucks right, or right, hundreds right. of thousands of bucks. Yeah. You know, and they're usually preying upon people who are either unstable or in extreme, uh, you know, state of mourning or something. Right. You know, in, in light of that, you can see what motivated, you know, Houdini and, and mm -hmm. Fulton to debunk. You seem to have come at it in your own work as not, obviously not having the same motivations. I mean, you're kind of neutral in terms of religion. You're interested in, I'll let you say it in your own words, but you're interested in the sort of systems of belief and what people sort of want to believe in and what they're willing to fall for and whatever reasons they'll they'll do that. I've always been interested in belief systems, you know, as you put it. Um, growing up Catholic, you know, you're a kid, you're sitting there, this is the body of Christ, and you're like, oh, that sounds like a vampire to me. And now I'm, <laughs> you know, drinking the blood, you know, and these kind of things. And, and you're thinking about 
pagans in hell and heaven and hell and all these characters that nobody sees. Mm. And so at a certain point, if you have half a brain, you kind of deconstruct it and so forth. And then if you just leap from that to conceptual art, where I was kind of inculcated into that at CalArts, and I, I can't help but sort of see these kind of overlapping, you know, systems of belief mm. that, that go into any kind of you know. And also photography, I mean, it's a, it's a system of representation that asks you to believe in what you're looking at, and it can yeah. be manipulated in lots of ways. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful perspective. I mean, many people don't really know that from the beginning, of course, you know this, but from the beginning, photography was really, you know, that was the, ver the veracity of it, it was com had came into question. Even war photography was staged. Right. And of course, William Mumler in town here, you know, was the first uh, spirit photographer. Right. And so he discovered spirits, which some people might call double exposures, right. which he could sell for 10 times, you know, what a carte de visite would have cost and, uh, mm -hmm. and more. Mm -hmm. And he ended up going to court over the whole thing as a kind of fraudulent accusations that he received. He was never convicted, but he was so shamed publicly that he threw all of his materials into the huts and I think or the somewhere into the river, oh, you know. Classified documents as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's amazing to me the way photography, starting with like x-rays and stop action photography and all the tricks it could do, all these kind of mysterious effects that turned up in photographs, 1880s to 1920s, let's say. It's interesting to me that there's like such a rush to see if photography can like photograph a human spirit or yeah. a spirit leaving a body and that kind of thing. It makes a lot of sense. Now it seems very, you know, kind of humorous and all poetic in a sense, but you know, I'm. It completely in love with this one kind of strand of, of uh, pseudo-scientific photography called thought photography, which, okay. you know, around the time that the X-rays were discovered, there was also numerous other rays were discovered, mm -hmm. including the fictitious N-ray in France. And so with given that as a kind of background, people thought, well, perhaps you could take an image of a spirit or of a thought. I, I'm really fascinated by the, I have to say that over the years, the, the projections of the sort of talking faces onto the sculptures have always in some ways kind of irritated me, you know, like these, <laughs> and I think they're meant to, to do that too. I'm wondering when you started to do, evolving from that form to like the projections on trees, for mm. example, which I think are really haunting. You know, I, kind of, I guess it was 91 where I was doing the projections on the dolls, the kind of uh, figures, kind of folk they're almost like scarecrows or something with video projected faces. And I with your them. own writing, right? I mean, it's it, your yeah. own text. Yeah, I mean, read. sometimes I'll appropriate like the MMPI, uh, multi-phasic personality inventory, which is a kind of series of psychological questions, you know, right. the kind of Rosetta Stone of psychology, mm -hmm. things like that. As time went on, uh, the projectors got more available and so forth, and then um, in, 98, 99, I started thinking more about public work, mm -hmm. and I had a great opportunity with uh, Art Angel and the Public Art Fund here. Mm -hmm. And out of that came this kind of phantasmagorical space, you know, where there were this kind of mixture between magic lanterns and performers. Um, it's a really hybrid between magic. the stage and film at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's a great kind of, it's symbolic space for a kind of transitional space. I learned from some of that history and began to think about projection in a different way. Mm -hmm and out in the public space onto buildings and trees and smoke, mm -hmm. which specifically came out of that research, out of looking at the phantasmagoria because there were these kind of super primitive projections onto smoke, which is like a small plume, you know, with a very dimly lighted. This massive archive you have, uh, the sort of imponderable archive, I guess it's been named in a previous book and shows, is a collection of all of these different sort of, I don't know, paranormal belief systems in photography and other kinds of documentary form. Obviously your research for what you're interested in doing in your own work, but it's also become a kind of archive of like conspiracy theories and things like that as well. And I mean, 
I wonder if in the beginning when you were, even in some ways it's the term magical thinking, I think, that is a term you've used before and Joan Didion used in this book about, you know, grief process with her husband and daughter. But um, magical thinking is this interesting term now in this political context because it um, feels like new ways of thinking about the world and maybe new solutions to that but also more and more it seems to just identify in my mind with like conspiracy theorists and sort of anti-evolutionary you know belief systems and things like that escapism really you know and, right um, so it's a sort of pitting rationalism against enchantment in a way and it's an interesting conflict because we want the world to be enchanted in mm -hmm. many ways i mean we're both deeply invested in cultural production and mm -hmm. cultural production means wild thinking, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of growing thought and so forth, not suppressing things and also not judging people on magical thinking, you know, when, right. when you come to a, this is what we were talking about earlier, you know, not passing judgment on anybody's belief system, you know, mm -hmm. which is the kind of fascist approach, you know, as long as it doesn't encroach on other people's right. belief systems or something, and mm -hmm. that to see the threads of it, the coexistence of it with the archive in a, in a specific way around water as we yes. take a glass of water. Cheers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been a fun process to really look at it because I, it's also a little bit reflective of me because some of the stories I want to pull out of it are, are pretty strange, like the Neptune crossing, you know, which is this very bizarre ritual having to do with sailors or anybody actually crossing the equator and a ritual which is a kind of hazing ritual, which is supposed to be a kind of pact with Neptune. And I suppose it, it's, it's a means of protecting the sailor from the unknown, you mm -hmm. know, and making a kind of pact with this ancient god, you know, right. but the process is quite bizarre and horrible. Think of just in terms of all of these float, all of these different kinds of ideas about explanations for the world that come out in the archive and in your own work. It, it, it seems to me that the context is so shifted in the last six years with sort of disinformation and, and all of that. That's a really good um, question because one of the things I don't like about the political climate is that there's it's very much based on closing people down into categories mm -hmm. and keeping certain people out and what I love about art is that it, it it brings people together it's like when people come to New York where do they go you know they're mm -hmm. gonna go right to the museum mm -hmm. and it, regardless of their politics regardless of their station in life they think oh, yeah that's the thing to do if you think about that also in terms of like data the data is when collage was invented you take two different images and put them together and it's confusing for people it's disorienting mm -hmm. and you come up it, it, it ignites the same part of the brain and you come up with new theories around that. Mm. But it's the same part of the brain. Mm. One of them takes you to be like, you know, I lost, um, life is done, everyone's against me. Mm -hmm. And the other shows you possibilities. And mm. I think that's where we gotta go with the art, you know. An exhibition of Tony Arzler's work titled Anomalous is on view at Photo Elysee in Lausanne, Switzerland until September 25th. A new exhibition titled Crossing Neptune opens on September 29th in Cincinnati, Ohio as part of the 2022 Photo Focus Biennial. The following conversation with Adriana Marmarek took place on Manhattan's west side on May 16th, 2022. Adriana Marmarek is a Colombian artist based in Madrid. Her work explores themes of desire and love through photography, video, installation, and sculpture. With lush and piquant imagery, she celebrates human desire as an irrational and disruptive force in our highly regulated modern lives. So you grew up in uh, Bogota. Can you describe to me what, what Bogota was like in the 80s? Well, I, I think I, I was raised in, in an incredible country at the beginning of my life. My dad was a vice president of an insurance company mm -hmm. and he had to travel a lot. And that was the time when I was able to know my country more. Mm -hmm. Then things 
became difficult. In terms of politics and Yes, uh, and insecurity violence. with a lot of panic mm -hmm. involved with the Pablo Escobar very much on the scene. The choices one has in terms of career in that kind of environment, maybe it was an artist, being an artist, an obvious choice for you, or was that something a little bit sort of <laughs> no. unexpected? My dad didn't want me to study <laughs> anything that had to do with the creative world. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to do something that had to do with creativity and uh, I thought of design or arts, but applicated arts more than arts, because right. I didn't f felt I could really do something incredible. Mm -hmm. My mom had to study art mm -hmm. and I didn't show like an incredible talent. Uh -huh. So we negotiate and we negotiate for communication, mm -hmm. uh, social communication. I began my life as uh, doing copywriter and I work for international brands. And then I went into a TV channel that was uh, beginning from zero. There I got saturated with advertising. It was mm -hmm. double way because I was very free to do many things mm -hmm. that I wanted to create, but of course for a brand. I think I learned from the channel that I could uh, dream to do whatever I wanted mm -hmm. uh, creatively wise. Learning how the world works is an important thing for an artist to know about. And you know, you said, Maybe you didn't show a lot of talent, but art art is also about ideas. It's not simply about sort of your skill at drawing or something but, like but that. But you know, the interesting thing is that I didn't show skills painting or drawing. Right. But I did doing a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And right. that was like the hit because I end up doing like a, my mom brought me a piece of clay from the farm and mm -hmm. I did a, a, a figure and she was like, how did you do that? And I was like, I don't know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it came out incredibly. So that was the line that I began to. Right, right, right. And, and I ended up at a very important uh, sculptor. She's Alicia Tafur, and she taught me how to work. And I did that parallel of my studies and my work on advertising. Mm -hmm. And I worked with her for nine years. So although I didn't study arts, I had an investment uh, in time and uh, total immersion mm -hmm. with clay and with bronze that mm -hmm. we ended up mm -hmm. uh, doing the work in mm -hmm. bronze. Your work takes many forms. You make sculpture, you use film and video and performance even to some degree, I think, and like burning things and all that. <laughs> but I think that what holds it together is, is certain themes, you know, like love and desire and those kinds of things. For us as, uh, you know, Americans, it seems like Latin culture is very associated with this kind of subject matter, even like in the films of Moldavar and, and things like that. But um, how did you come to that subject matter? I definitely arrived to it because of my practice. It was a reading that I did of my sculptures. So you the listen. The subject matter of the... I, I worked for nine years mm -hmm. without any intentions of exhibiting or anything. So I had mm -hmm. a very free way of seeing my work mm -hmm. and talking to it. Mm -hmm. But my work began to talk, not only to me, but people that saw it would say, oh, this is erotic. And I was like, erotic? <laughs> it didn't mm -hmm. matter what... Mm -hmm. idea I had, mm -hmm. they used to say things like that. So I, I began to really s try to understand what, what was my work saying to me. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to take the subject <laughs> with my both hands right, right, and right. go yeah. deep into it. And I then understood that it was really, I mean, for me, art has to come from the inside. And it was beautiful to have the opportunity to let my work talk freely to me and then to mm -hmm. really go deep in concept to those things that were evident in my practice. And that's the way I've been working. I was following this idea of the 70s and the 80s of woman object as an object, mm -hmm. especially on advertising. You could really see it like everything that you wanted to sell needed a woman with a, <laughs> a bikini. It didn't matter if it was a beer or a fridge, but... <laughs> uh -huh. So I, I began working around that, and then it moved to the idea of what happens with sexuality and how sexuality is also like a coin. I love Octavio Paz that says that in this revolution that they did, they wanted freedom, freedom for sexuality, for example, for right. women, for everything, and then 
uh, all the commerce and all the interest, uh, financial interest, became interested in these subjects and mm -hmm. took them. I'm particularly interested in women in Latin American culture. I know it's not the same country to country, but like women in Latin America and Colombia, particularly, versus maybe Argentina or Spain, or even here in the United States. What has been the, the sort of values around women, that objectification of women in particular? But, but I think it's interesting that maybe it has changed here more. Right. That, and you can see it in, on advertising, uh, on the way you talk about women and families and uh, relations and mm -hmm. everything than in, in countries like Colombia. But what we're moving, and, and I think it's interesting, but it's also complicated because all these economical threats mm -hmm. are still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's important to question what's happening with erotism and also with, with love, because mm -hmm. I think it's something that we're not paying enough attention. Mm -hmm. Everything is in, in a movement right now the way the couple was like the sustainable center of the society. Right. And I think it's okay that many things moved, mm -hmm. but we have to think about it, mm -hmm. not just let them move. Mm -hmm. I think we should be having reflections and thoughts about what is going on and where are we going to. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, for example, <clears throat> I have a piece that I love that looks for the latest Twitter with the word love. Mm -hmm. For example, I really see a difference in Spanish versus English. Mm -hmm. Let's say not Latin America and the United States I, I, mm -hmm. with the language. Right. And love in Spanish is love. In English is I like. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you explain that? I mean, in the U.S. we. But, but uh, you but do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. Because it's like now you we love everything. Mm -hmm. So in the Twitter machine that I did. Uh -huh. uh, that looks for this Twitter and it's called Penelope, like mm -hmm. uh, Penelope of Uly Ulysses. Right. So it's a strategy of printing, but it's like taking off the net mm -hmm. and uh, kneading and then unkneading. So mm -hmm. it threads and unshreds un the messages. I think Americans use it hyperbolically. Like we say, we love everything. I love this um, beer. I love this, you know, show. Um, whereas w what you're saying is in, in Spanish culture, you, you say love, you mean love. You actually love or in love with someone or something. Yeah. And I think we're paying a lot of attention on how we name things. And I think we should pay attention to this. It's interesting. I mean, love is such an important value. It's something that's so central to everybody. And yet it doesn't seem like it has a lot of use for researchers or advertisers or marketers. I mean, of course, it can be manipulated in so many ways. And one of the things that I really makes me think that we are in a time that you choose freely with whom you want to be. Right, yeah. And it's the time that more separations in relations happen. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Mm -hmm. What are we not doing right? Or how should relations be? But it seems like to be together with the person and then to be separated is something that marks people really. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it's like a big, big issue. I have mm -hmm. a project that I work with love relics. So mm -hmm. what's the future for us in terms of what's relations and love and then also the base of the, of the society? I mean, what's your theory about that? Is it, is it just the culture of distractedness, uh, too many possibilities? I like to make questions. And with my work, I try to highlight those questions. Mm -hmm. There is also a connection between erotism and, and love mm -hmm. that we have been always trying to put separated. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm studying that at the moment. Mm -hmm. And my PhD has to do with eros, and it has to do with Duchamp, mm -hmm. with Eros et la vie. My project has to do with killing Rosa la vie. Duchamp's alter ego posed yeah. as a woman, and uh, it's a wordplay in French. Yes, uh, yeah. exactly. Eros is life, and Rose C'est la vie is the woman's name, yeah. Yes. Um, I was going to say, there's a lot of surrealism in your work. I mean, I see influences like Hieronymus Bosch, and, but also surrealism, this idea of kind of attraction, repulsion that goes on um, in desire. Desire is very much, uh, or sex even, is very much something that's both sort of beautiful and, and sort of messy at the same time. 
Yes, I, I think uh, surreal, surreal, surrealism <laughs> right. is, uh, is important, very important, because there is a lot of surrealism in erotism. <laughs> yes, the surrealists saw it as like the un unconscious. So however we behave throughout the day, that's the sort of ego. But, but the, the sex life is something private, something that erupts into the everyday. And they sort of cultivated this as a way to express some sort of uh, greater sense of reality, this interior reality, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I mean, I think you're examining love and eros as, as something something sort of more vital beneath the surface of you know, absolutely, everyday life. Absolutely. And I think we have made very superficial both of them. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about love and how it became mm -hmm. superficial in a way, mm -hmm. and also erotism. Mm -hmm. The parts of society that talk about these themes are now only into pornography and, mm -hmm. and commerce of sexuality. Who else talks about erotism? Mm -hmm. Right. It's because it's able Nobody. to become a market that way, you know. Right? Well, I'm reading also a book, <laughs> yes, right, right. Why Love Hurts from Eva Ilus, she's a uh, sociologist, and she says that the issue with love is that it became uh, also part of the market. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of challenges, not only the ones that we talk a lot about political mm -hmm. and ecology mm -hmm. issues that we, of course, have to address, but also we have to address things like uh, that have to do with how we relate mm -hmm. as people conforming a society. Adriana Marmarek continues her research into mythologies of love, including the tragic story of her own grandparents. 